Yes. And so for now, we're going to have a, a little bit of a slower pace as we move into our second match. We got uh, Yarla versus Pavel that's coming up here. Uh, the records are not uh, indicative of anything playoff related. However, uh, they are still playing for prize money in this one, and they are also playing for a mega amount of pride in this one because it's one of my favorite matchups, Sadl. Sorry, there's more pride involved because you like the matchup. Is no, there's pride saying? involved for them. Uh, right. Because, like you said yesterday, they don't want to have an embarrassing-looking number next to their it's name. It's true. And Those are your words, not mine. I, and I will stand by them. Good. Uh, um, it's a bottom-of-the-table clash as well. So, you know, both of these players are really trying to put themselves in a more respectable position. And it's two names. I mean, it's hard to say this because... All of the players in the division are of such a level of quality where any name being at the bottom would be surprising. But Pavel is a previous world champion. And Pavel backed up that world championship victory where, you know, he was accused by ignorant onlookers of just high rolling his way to a world championship because of one insane moment. He then backed that up with another incredible year of Hearthstone after that, proving that he is one of the very best consistently. So I would not expect him, even coming back from a break, to be you know this low down in the table for this long. First couple of weeks, maybe. But to this point, I would have expected him, like we've seen Hunter Ace do, just prove the pedigree of a world champion and rise up. And Yala, honestly, very similar story. I've, I've only been here for one week, but I spent that week, a lot of it, extolling the virtues of Yala as one of the potentially best players, particularly of control decks. So it's amazing to me that this is the bottom of the table clash in Division B, and I'm sure both of these players are going to want to do everything they can to avoid being on the bottom at the end of the season. I'm glad you set the stage as beautifully as you did, because it meant that I got to look at the decklist and hear that we're going to Pavel's first. Pavel decklist is what we're taking a look at. He's brought Bomb Warrior this week. Uh, no augmented Elix in the deck. This was the call for Gallon at the Masters Tour event. Gallon is a professional player. And um, <laughs> kind of looking at the deck list overall, I see why Elic is not brought to this, but honestly, I don't like it. I like Elic. I think Elic's very threatening, and I think it adds a, an interesting dynamic to your from hand range whoa, of plays that whoa. you can make. Are you disagreeing with our Lord and Savior Gallon? Uh, for, well, for the Masters Tour, it was great. There were so many Warriors there that playing Augmented Elec, I think, was a negative thing. Okay, so which matchups is it a positive to not have Alex, and which matchups do you want to have them? I, I think it, it's not bad versus Warrior, but it's not good. Mm -hmm. And in pretty much every other matchup, I feel like Alec is pretty good. Okay. Uh, in the in the mirror match specifically, it's not necessarily the greatest in the world. Perhaps you'd like to have one copy of it, which is a, a bit where Yarla gets got on this one. Uh, is he does have two Alex, which means the reason that Alec is weaker is because of Dynomatic specifically. If you play an augmented Alec, you are very vulnerable to that card, which is normally weak in the matchup, to become very strong very suddenly. Yep. Uh, also carrying a copy of Spell uh, Spellbreaker in his main deck is Yala's secondary deck, packed full of value. Second of Mega Assembly comes in alongside Harrison Jones, Campbell, of Geppetto, Joy Buzz, and the Elysiana coming in as well. I like the Spellbreaker. I think Spellbreaker is a great insurance plan versus Rogue. I think it's very strong versus opposing Acolytes of Pain. I think it's just a good card in the deck. Like, I, Bomb Warrior plays very much like a mid-range aggro deck. And what if mid-range aggro decks historically loved running? A Silence. He does lose that copy of the Spellbreaker in his secondary deck, which he will most likely be switching to for the Warrior matchup, though. So we will see how that plays into things. Uh, neither player with a main deck Elysiana in game one, so um, not a departure from the norm, but Elysiana at least creates the possibility of a very, very long game between two Bomb Warriors. Uh, this will certainly not be that because the decks will start to stack up with those Bomb cards very, very quickly. And even Bomb Warriors can struggle to withstand the onslaught of an opposing Bomb Warrior. Indeed. And kind of something I'm looking at here is just the opening Maybe. iteration. And you know, how important tech cards actually are in this matchup. Uh, Wrench Caliber is one of the best cards in the matchup, bar none. Uh, in order for Yarla to set up Wrench Caliber, he has to risk playing against Pavel's Harrison Jones. Uh, Pavel's on coin this game, and so he really needs to make sure that he's parsing out that coin properly. If you coin out a three cost card or you coin out a four cost card, it means that Wrench Caliber can come down unchecked. And so one of the things in the matchup that Yarla's looking to do is actually pressure Pavel and hope to prompt a coin four mana answer from him. And so without a three drop here, Yarla, I think, is going to be hanging on to this wrench caliber for a long time or throwing complete caution to the wind, jamming it out as quickly as possible and hoping he doesn't see Harrison Jones. With Yarla being one of the best at these uh, macro game plan strategies, I will be curious to see how that wrench caliber gets used. I don't anticipate it on turn four. 
That's right, even against an Acolyte. <laughs> I was just about to say, that is a nice juicy target for a wrench caliber to come down. Acolyte might be actually the best one, and this thinking specifically would be for uh, Dynamatic to come down on your Militia Commander. But in my opinion, I think the, the Dynamatic coming down to the Militia Commander is not necessarily a bad thing for you, because that means your Elec is going to get opened up later on, which means that your Wrench Calibre gets stronger later on. However, this does force Pavel to use a coin in Harrison Jones. So what are the merits to that? Also, two copies of Dynamatic, one copy of Harrison Jones. There's just a... a much smaller chance that this gets punished. But I think Yala, just from his face, saw Pavel reaching for the coin and knew immediately what was up. Yeah, my question is, what does the punish mean in the grand scheme of things? Agreed. Um, I think the Harrison Jones is much more punishing than a Dynamatic is. I would agree with that. This also prompts a Shield Slam. Granted, I think Dynamatic would have also prompted a Shield Slam. Uh, so this is the better Shield Slam target, if that's the case. This also risks Pavel uh, having to play into Dynomatic as well, which is a potential payoff draw for Yarla. So, merits to both sides. It's a very ugly looking turn for Yarla. The Shield Slam just being so low tempo here is what's really holding it back. Because, you know, Shield Slam will get used in the Warrior Mirror on some pretty innocuous targets if it gets you tempo on the board a lot of the time. But it's just no play alongside the Shield Slam. Yala just has to suck it up, drop an Eternium Rover. I am, I'm pretty surprised by the Eternium Rover here. Why? Specifically, Militia Commander and Wrench Caliber. Like, both of those are... I guess against Wrench Caliber, you're fine. But against Militia Commander, that's like... Ooh, I don't know. That feels, ooh, just feels like it hurts. It's another four health thing. You have your own militia commander, but again, you're put right back into that dynamatic style Maybe situation. Yeah. Th no, 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 no. I would think Yala's pretty comfortable seeing a militia commander coming down here. The other thing, too, is uh, the Zilliax usage, right? You know, one of my instincts is to hold a turning rover with Zilliax for the combination of those two. Um, in the matchup, however, with no Elysiana being present, I think Zilliax so rapidly choices. increases in value very quickly as the game progresses. Yes. And so sort of the nature of it is the longer the game goes on, the more that you want to keep Zilliax. And the longer the game goes on, the better your Zilliax you know, health swings get because you're able to, you know, make a Devastator Zilliax for huge yeah. health gain later on. And as you mentioned, because there's no Elysiana in the decks, they will be taking huge amounts of bond, bomb damage and looking to survive through that as much as they can. I will add one more caveat to it, which is one of my favorite things to do with Eternium Rover is once my opponent has played Blastmaster Boom, I play Eternium Rover and then I Warpath. Okay. And then the Eternium Rover tends to soak up a lot of that damage where otherwise it kind of just gets poked away and nothing really happens. Right. Yala sat on a very reactive hand right now, just trying to work out if he can do anything proactive this turn. He can. It is a possibility. I do think that if you're going to be in a reactive hand situation, you know, this is a pretty ideal state. You have Dr. Boom Mad Genius. Yep. I, I'm not convinced by these Eternium Rovers. I really am not. And for Pavel, I, I was just about to say, I think he can read into this and just go, you know what? This is a totally fine card to play on this turn. My opponent clearly doesn't really have much to do. If they're going to play Blastmaster Boom or they're going to play Dr. Boom Mad Genius, start hitting them hard. Yep. With a snip, snap, in hand, this makes all the sense in the world to me. There's that Spellbreaker found, though, from Yala. Your right opponent's going to attach two snip snaps after you play your Dr. Boom Mad Genius. Yep. <laughs> I do think uh, that Militia Commander is uh, a bit worse here than the Dr. Boom Mad Genius simply because you've drawn the Spellbreaker. Without the Spellbreaker, I'd probably be in favor of Militia Commander. Very little thinking time from Pavel. Just jamming some Snip Snaps, going to town. When you Magnetizes can both, pushes eight. When you can secure the damage from Snip Snap, ooh, it is so much better than when you just play it. Not to mention, single copy of Spellbreaker in Yala's deck, which he will most likely lose for game two and three. 
but is able to use it to get a pretty nice tempo swing here alongside that militia commander. And as long as he can secure himself a little bit of tempo on the board, make sure he's not falling behind every turn that passes where he has Mad Genius and Pavel does not is going to be a small incremental advantage. Yeah, him. from here, Yarla, I think is, you know, that turn was an exception to the hero powers where the laser just isn't generating. From yeah. here on out, I expect him to be uh, using hero power just about as often as possible. Right. So Even for choices. the tiniest difference. Like, you want to even just get the kaboom in when you can because you need to take everything you can get from this spot because in terms of just card advantage, he's pretty far behind. Yes. Um, but through correct use of those hero powers, he will be able to close that gap quite quickly with Dr. Boom Mad Genius. The only time I think we'll see him foregoing hero powers here is if so it's necessary to not lose tempo on the board, because that is still number one. If Yala can maintain the status quo here and stretch the game out for a few more turns, he's going to take over because he's found his hero card. If Pavel explodes onto the board and starts being aggressive, Yala has to answer in kind. Really surprised that's not a dynamic turn. Same, honestly. That tells me Pavel is thinking pretty specifically about augmented ally. Defend the gates. Is it he wants to hold his dynamatic for the opponent's augmented ally when he needs to remove it? That is what it feels like to me. Okay. I'm also going to be a bit curious about the shield block. You know, with no armor generated. You're pretty interested in saving the shield block for shield slams at the right time. One shield slam remaining, I believe. I'm, I mean, on Pavel's side. Oh, on Pavel's side. Okay. Yeah, excuse me. I should have clarified that. We, we're in a mirror match. <laughs> for Yarla, it's a pretty interesting spot oh, okay, because then. Dynamatic is pretty decent here. You want to get in the hero power, but you also don't want Pavel to be able to respond adequately with cards that are typically weaker in the matchup. Uh, in this case, one of those instances is specifically Warpath. If you play Dynamatic and you hero power, you are opening up Pavel to close the gap from turn 9 to turn 10 with exactly Warpath. And so I think he's thinking about uh, A, using the hero power to clear off the Militia Commander, or B, simply playing other minions and having that be the sticking point for this. So notice he foregoes the hero power here, trying to really force the tempo issue very hard because he just doesn't have a ton of value. I'm quite surprised by this. I am quite surprised that the Clockwork Goblin is prioritized over uh, the Microbots in that spot. Do you wanted him to augmented Alec microbots or play neither of the minions and just microbots? Um, I'm okay with neither of the minions, but I think I, I prefer Alec and microbots in leaders. Wow, they're playing super hard for tempo, though. I mean, this could also be like a sign of respect for that tempo game where they both are aware the other is capable of exploding onto the board potential and they never recover for it. And so as a result, they are hard sacrificing resources in order to keep that from happening. Well, I think it makes sense to an extent, I think Pavel has to fight for tempo, right? Like, he he's play, plays out all his stuff. He has a Mega Assembly now that he's curving into, and he tries to play out more stuff because he's facing down Dr. Boom Mad Genius, and he doesn't have it. He's not, he's not winning a long value game at this point. He needs to try and be aggressive. The problem with doing that is that when you try and do that into Dr. Boom Mad Genius, it kind of just turns on all their cards where they get to react to what you're trying to do and then take care of things. But I think Yala still has to play... Um, fairly quickly in response to make sure that he's not falling behind too quickly. Yeah, that's the part I disagree with. Okay. I feel like when you have Dr. Boom Mad Genius oh, and okay your opponent does it, you, you don't chill. have to do anything. All right. <laughs> oh, I love that you probably got to warpath this, but you know, other than that, you don't really have to do anything. Yeah, Warpath is last big removal in hand right now. I actually kind of like this missile launcher, honestly. It does pay heat directly to Kabo. <laughs> it keeps the Warpath for card draw as well. I, this has been this has been yeah, interesting yeah, yeah. to me. So like, that's actually what like he's still a couple of cards ahead. He's not he's got so much health he's not worried about drawing bombs. So I think Acolyte Warpath is actually a realistic possibility now for the matchup. Um, I also think Warpath is like his last major removal card in hand. Uh, he does play two brawls, does Yala, in his main deck. But without either of those in hand, 
he doesn't want suddenly a board state to appear that he's going to struggle to take care of. But you kind of see what I'm getting at, though. Like, it's pretty rare that I I am like staunchly confident in my ability to, to pilot a deck. Yeah. I have just played in an, an unhealthy amount of bomb warrior. My doctor actually prescribed that I stop <laughs> playing it. Uh, I will happily concede <laughs> that you are a far superior Bomb Warrior player than I am. Um, so I will definitely oh, take on board yeah, anything yeah. you say in the matchup. That, that's why it's interesting me, though, is because, A, it started out aggressive. Yeah. And it continued to be aggressive. And then there was no sign whatsoever from either side that they were willing to deviate at all from that aggression. That is just very unusual. I feel like I'm in the opposite of the TJ camp. He's out flaming people for being too passive. I'm out here flaming him for being too aggressive. <laughs> oh, I love that fuse thing. Hmm. Let the pain speak to me. Like the this was clearly, the Warpath or the Dynamatic was clearly aimed at this Acolyte. Yep. For Yarla this game. And that Shield Slam's a very fortunate draw, or you'd be looking at him just you know, tanking damage or sacking minions. Neither of which are things you're very interested in doing. Yeah, it's a very smart Shield Slam, because if you don't Shield Slam there, then Pavel has the opportunity to push minimum seven plus any magnetism that he's found off the Omega Assembly, which then just cleaves through your armor anyway, and you're sat with a dead Shield Slam in hand. So it makes perfect sense. Yeah, Shield Slam is, uh, I think, oftentimes in this matchup, kind of the opposite of how it used to be uh, in Warrior Next, where you would hang on to the card for dear life in oh, a yes. pitch. Yes. And in Bomb Warrior matchups, you are like, I am not going to have this armor for long. It's also just unpredictable, too, like the random occurrence of you drawing a bomb. Yep. Shreds the armor away. The random appearance of you just gaining seven armor again. Ooh, that's a big draw. There is another consideration uh, also that I want to add with uh, keeping your board state a bit weaker so that Warpath isn't effective against you. Forcing Warpath from your opponent means that they do technically have less reach at the end of the game with just a Blastmaster Boom and Warpath. That is true. I gotta move! Bomb's going in. Pavel trying to secure his uh, maximum delegation of boom bots for the following turn. Still has a wrench caliber swing that he can pair immediately with that Blastmaster boom as well, if necessary. This would be a good time for a master plan. Yeah, honestly, I'm kind of looking at these spots and Despite the Dr. Boom being in play, I actually might be thinking this is Pavel favored right now. Would you go as far as to say that Blastmaster Boom is the more important boom in the matchup if you're going to draw one of the two? I definitely think it is. Okay. Um, just, you know, I think that given the cadence of the match, how aggressively they've been playing for board, tells you a big story. That story is damage matters. Yeah. Uh, the one cost of Blastmaster Boom really is that your overall amount of armor that you gain technically oh, goes down. That uh, if you are looking at hero powers every single turn, you deal a bit more damage, you prevent some more damage, but you don't actually just get more armor when nothing's happening. And so when that's the case, you need to defend your life total pretty aggressively. If that's the case, what that means is dealing lots of damage very aggressively has a large payoff to it. What's the card in the deck that deals the most damage all at once? Blastmaster Boom. Speaking of Blastmaster Boom, and speaking of Blastmaster Boom uh, Warpath, which was available earlier, it looks pretty powerful that turn. Yeah, you want to use the Blastmaster after your opponent's minions uh, have died, because the last thing you want is all these boom bots splashing into one ones and one twos and stuff. And so you look at those Eternium Rovers that Yarla had used, they soaked up some wrench caliber swings. But in this spot, double Eternium Rover and Warpath would be a massive dent in the amount of damage these Boombots are dealing. I think his aggressive play has cost him a lot this game. Yep, it's pretty ugly no matter how you slice it. It's some combination of Snip Snap Warpath, I think. This 
This would be a good time for a master plan. Turnium Rover. Did someone order an Eternium Rover, Admirable? Yeah, someone did. Oh, I love that fuse thing. I think that alone <laughs> explains a lot of those Eternium Rovers in my uh, Light the fuses. consideration for their use. <laughs> I was going to mention this when you were talking about um, Snip Snap Warpath turns. Of course, like, Dynamatic is just a clean answer to Dr. Boom a lot of the time. I'm not choosing into doing it this way with the Eternium Rover, though. I guess technically he leaves more health on the board and gets paid off by tanking two bombs. The first bomb would have killed the Eternium Rover if he had done it the other way. He did cut into this very well. Oh, no. That's bad news for Yarla. That is, it. oh, that I, is I, really bad news. I figured out what it was just from what you were saying, but I didn't see it off the top. I only saw it when it came into the hand. In terms of resources, Pavel is massively so ahead. ahead right now. Yep. There's a Snip Snap on Yarla's side, which I think is an extremely valuable card right now. However, I think that just simply the fact that Pavel is going to seize initiative off the back of this, you start to see why the Elix can be a detriment in the matchup. If you have to use your cards aggressively, you cannot save Elix to duplicate bombs. Right. So Elix becomes a liability in the face of Dynamatic. And crucially, because of Pavel's aggression, basically, essentially Pavel's aggression, made Yala have to respond very aggressively himself. And then because of that, Yala was not able to just slowly grind out that small advantage every turn that being in Mad Genius form gives you. So when Pavel, a few turns later, has found his own Mad Genius, he has not fallen behind in the resource count whatsoever. Part of that is also down to the fact that Pavel placed two copies of Omega Assembly in his main deck and has therefore had access to an Omega Assembly already this game. Okay, then. That's a scary card, though. Snip snap. It's just a tough one to deal with. I think the real big story here is that Yarla just doesn't have much to follow it up with. Okay, then. Instinct was moving towards uh, a Mega Devastator and Hero Power. Okay, then. Wow, nothing super clean. Yeah, it is a little awkward. I wonder where the Pavel wants to get usage out of a Shield Slam here first as well, before he starts drawing bombs of his own. He is going to go Omega Devastator instead. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the Vicious Scrap Pound and Zilliax uh, for the Shield Slam. I That's think, fair. That's I think fair. Pavel has a bit more liberty of saving it this game. Okay. You're right. That's tough, though. I mean, it's just, that's a lot of cards to save for one turn in a pinch. But it also means just in terms of total armor, right? He goes up to 14 armor this turn. Uh, he has Scrap Hound Ziliax for more armor gain. He has any Blast Shields that he rolls in the meantime, and he's not under pressure from Yala chipping that down. So that's a lot of bombs he has to draw in a row for him to not have a live Shield Slam over the next couple of turns. Shield block found for Yala. He still has his one copy of Omega oh, Assembly okay, remaining yeah. in his deck. Yeah. You were kind of hoping this shield block might have been the last card. You think it's going that way? Well, you just don't want to draw it. Sure. It's a, <laughs> you, know, if you just never draw it, you don't have to thin your deck. And when it's the last card, you know it's the last card. I mean, it's either going to sit dead in your hand at some point or just cycle through and, hmm. That's you know, potentially exacerbate a situation. It's, you know, I think oftentimes pretty ideal if these are your last two cards. I think he has to play it here, but... Especially with uh, Shield Slam being... Both Shield Slams being used already for Yala as yep. well. That kind of cuts away the last remaining utility that Shield Block might have. Yeah, close up a bomb, that's about it. I can definitely see the resource game going dead from here, though. And it just being a matter of, like, who's ahead on life total at the end. Yeah.
Always a welcome sight to discover a mech. I think given that Yarla has held on to a number of cards this game, uh, Pavel is able to deduce the cards in hand pretty closely to a combination of Brawls, Dynomatics, Zilliax, Augmented Elec, and perhaps uh, Warpath. Maybe Omega Devastator as well. I think there's a possibility that that would have been held on to as well this game. And so I think when you consider Elec and that there is a Wrench Caliber attached, that Dynomatics sticks around the hand. Speaking of the lack of value in Yala's hand, it's worth cool. it's worth calling out. Okay, some va oh. some value has entered the hand now, but but really a nullifier. The remaining ten cards in Yala's deck is a big old stack of bombs, and then two Omega Devastators, one Omega Assembly still in there as well. So he's been really lacking a lot of his most valuable cards as we've hit the this late game period. I mean, he's had Doctor Boom up the whole game though. He has, but his Blastmaster Boom is still in the deck, whereas Pavel's had both of them. Ah, uh, the Blastmaster Boom of the deck does make me want to really take the Boom, the boom Reaver. Uh, yeah. just, you have a 7-7 seven, seven sitting in there. But why would you want to pull your Blastmaster Boom out of your deck slash Derek Brown? <laughs> I was about to say Derek <laughs> Brown. Yeah. Perhaps, uh, you know, one more check of the card. I don't blame him. He never played Bomb Warrior. <laughs> yeah, at least Derek probably knows how multi-shot works, right? Look, I was the one talking. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag shots fired at Dave TJ. <laughs> At least he's not the one telling people not to play <laughs> Dr. Boom at Genius on turn seven. I like how you're about to just blow straight through that for a second, and then you registered what I said. Yeah, that's right. Sottle and I did read the patch notes. Yeah. We discussed multi-shot as an option. We did. Because it could blow up Spirit of the Shark by itself now. Because we're smart. SMRT. This would be a good you're time a for a match to play in. Admirable, so conflicted right now. No, I, no, I'm not. I'm just looking at Pavel's hand, and I'm like, I want to shield slam it. I'm listening. Oh, I don't okay, want then. to shield slam it because my opponent just discovered a mech, and it could be a lot of different things. My chances to get either laser or microbots next turn are fine because. Okay, I could get behind this. I think that the armor uh, Zilliax thing, you know, I was talking about it's hard to hold on to this for a long time. Yeah. In my head, Pavel had just committed to and holding again, on to it. Like, yeah, Blast Shield again. Like, how how many bombs does Pavel have to draw that he doesn't get usage out of this shield? Slam? It's just it's just so statistically unlikely at this point. Yeah, and for Yarla here, he's looking for dead hero powers at this point. So, like, laser, perhaps microbots, uh, as the microbots value is starting to diminish as you need actual board instead of just, you know, an annoyance and a nuisance to your opponent. Yeah. So I think he's looking for, like, laser and Kaboom specifically to play uh, the Boom Reaver. But then I think Microbots also would get replaced by Boom Reaver in this, this instance. Would be a so that's Especially now there's, now there's two in hand. Yeah. You have to get a lot more loose with which hero powers you're willing to skip. You've with the got Reaver. to spend 20 mana on yeah. these sooner rather than later. You need them to hit 7-7s, seven and then you need to follow up with Blastmaster Boom. That's how Yarlow wins this game. You'll be okay with a 4-5 as well, I think. But yeah, yeah, yeah you I, will. I, ideal world, yeah, you want it to hit that 7-7. Seven, seven. I mean, that is 20 <laughs> mana in two cards. Like, you've got to use those. Oh, I'm not passing 7 armor here, but... I'm probably passing whatever comes up next, even if it's Discover a mech here. Whoa, 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 whoa. I got two Boom Reavers Whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa, oh, am I gonna get a third one? Just never use them? This would be I would rather concede a game of Hearthstone than not find out what's in my box, Admiral. <laughs> All right, Purple. Yeah. I'm, I'm telling you, I'm playing that Boom Reaver. I'm so mad about it, I'm gonna get angry. I'm gonna make a boar control face as this happens. <laughs> But I am not, and I, well, okay, maybe now I, gosh darn it, why do we have to draw the clockwork? <laughs> I am upset. <laughs> if that clockwork goblin didn't get drawn. We'll never know. I'm, I'm upset both ways, I really am. 
<laughs> just your default position. You're I just, get the perfect card! You're just upset. I guess you would probably uh, use the hero power to try to get the Clockwork Goblin. That would make sense. I digress. You're just an angry man, Nate. I am very angry right now. <laughs> no, I just meant in general, not right oh, now. Oh, yeah, well, that's true. But right now, see, normally it's just angry. That's my secret. Mm -hmm. My real name is actually Bruce Banner. This one's starting to look like it might be going all the way. Neither player really has the aggression available to build a board state. Yala really banking on his second Boom Reaver to do that for him. The first one is going to get answered pretty efficiently just from what we can see already from Pavel's hand. Notice that Pavel has made it a, a point to hang on to a Turnium Rover as well. And to Shield Slam. Like, that's the way you counter Blastmaster Boom. Shield Slam, Eternium Rover, Warpath. It demands a lot. Yes, that sounds like a lot of things to answer one card. And that's, that's why Boom Reaver to me is such an important facet of getting it down, you know, so soon. I think on this turn, there's actually still more deviation available for Yarla because it's pretty rare that Security Rover just looks like the nuts. This is one of those turns to me. But the Boom Reaver disrupts the potential for Pavel to use uh, Shield Slam specifically for Blastmaster Boom. You just demand a bigger answer. Despair. Destruction. Four five man. I like the Reaver this turn. I don't know. I'm still stuck on this. You have 20 mana's worth of, board of Boom Reavers in your hand. Get them played. I think Zap is one of the hero powers that you're you're down to being willing to pass off, especially when there's not a huge target for it apart from your opponent's face. Yep. You also have your own Warpath um, in a spot where it looks like you could answer the board pretty easily with uh, hmm. Boom Reaver and with Omega Devastator. Right. So having a security rover Warpath turn uh, still reasonable on your side. So That's I rough. think there's tons of reasons to, to go with the Boom Reaver here over the security rover. It's just so rare that I see that card be such a big nuisance. It's hard to use, but I think that he's in a position to uh, to take those tough spots. This time for a master plan. TLDR, bigger, better. Yeah. Oh, I love that use thing. Oh, we're just going to go four path here to take care of the board state. Yeah, I think super reasonable. Um, he's had a healthy enough life total that perhaps uh, he can use what he's done this game to uh, mitigate Blastmaster Boom. Still has Zilliax in hand as well. So I think he's in a, a pretty grand position to just hang on to the Shield Slam for a little bit longer. I think in his mind, you know, that's the Boom Reaper he's dealing with. And then he's going to just happen to run into a second Boom Reaper. Yeah, Microbots being up this turn works out pretty perfectly for Yala. Barely irrelevant hero power in the grand scheme of things. And this time, 7-7. Seven, seven. Uh-oh. There's no way. There's no way. It never happens. Uh-oh. It never happens. No, but I'm saying the Shield Slam. It, it, no, it never happens. Don't worry. It, it, the it, Shield it, Slam! It never happens. He still has 7. He it can't kill the Boom Reaver! It never happens. There we go. We're fine. <gasps> <laughs> I, st I knew what you meant immediately. He I just kept drawing them. I was starting to get worried after the third. After the third. Omega's one. Devastator, second Zilliax. Are you kidding? That is lit. That's like the best things you could get her. Those three. Are you okay? No. Look what. Look what's happening. I'm looking. I'm not okay. Use the dang shield slam. <laughs> You're never gonna get to use it again. <laughs> he has two Eternium Rovers in his hand. He's chilling. Don't Fair worry enough. About it. Don't worry about it. I'm very worried. Stop panicking. It's I'm, okay. I'm panicking. Do you need a lie down? I I need something. Okay. Just 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 wind it in. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, then. Essentially, TLDR of uh, Admirable's commentary on the last turn. That was a really good Omega assembly. It went quite well for Pavel. <laughs> In case you needed a translation to the tonality that I that I had with it. Yeah. Well, you were starting to, like, pitch up to the point where only dogs could hear you. So I, th I, thought, it, I thought it was important <laughs> just to clarify. Oh, I love that fuse thing. I've never seen someone struggle so much to save an Omega Devastator in my life. It's a cute oh. fight. It's a cute fight. Because, yeah, even if he loses the brawl, then the four damage goes on and his, his Zap Hero power takes care of the Omega Devastator. I, Yarla that was is, really cute. Yarla is the best player in the world at using Brawl. Like, I've seen a lot of good Brawls in my life. He just understands exactly when to use it to just get the potential maximum payoff for the card. Mm. A lot of times it's forced. Ah, my opponent has a lot of stuff, I have a Brawl. When it's not very forced and the margins are very slim, Yarla finds a way. It's like the fifth time in Grandmasters I have seen him use brawls in 50-50 scenarios where I look down and I go, wow, that is just good. Like, those outcomes both mean decent things for you, and sometimes it's just like, he's not going to win if he uses the whatever-whatever here, so he's got to brawl and get lucky. Either way, he just finds such good ways to use brawl. Somebody order a bomb. Yes, making fun of Darius. Wow. I like Darius. He's good people. <laughs> <laughs> all right, that's not how I interpreted that at all. It's the uh, the well played video that he does, where it just comes up, and, like Clockwork Goblin comes up, says the voice line. And Darius goes, "Yes, I'm Clockwork Goblin, we did." <laughs> just makes me laugh. He is never using that shield slam ever again. I hated that Zilliax. Well, you were pretty happy to see it. The first, the usage of the first one is what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I understand. would have shield slammed 100% of the time there. I understand. And I think now it's the exact opposite, where it's cost him. Yeah, I think you're right. Two attorney rovers. I think you whack the hero power here. I'm not sure if you attack attack and otherwise. I'm not, I actually don't know what the math on this is. This is something I have not calculated. Well, I've calculated that. It's bad. That's bad. That is, find x where x is equal to or greater than bad. Oh, I love that news thing. Wow, I'm surprised I haven't done this, actually. Boombot versus two Eternium Rover. Uh, playing for Shield Slam versus Attack and Kaboom Map. Like, that one's good. OK. So now if he were to kaboom and take zero damage to his face, which is impossible. That's no, not impossible. All right, he's going to go Zilliac through instead, which secures it. Makes sense. Ow! All right. Golly! Why are you so excited? <gasps> he missed the attack! Oh, no, no, no. I'm almost out of cards. And now, with this last card being a bomb as well, I believe, yeah, it's down straight to fatigue from this point. Turnium Rover versus Omega, uh, double Omega Devastator here. I think when you pick up Beryllium Nullifier here, um, you have to look at the situation and go, how do I lose the game? Because he could deduce what Pavel has remaining in hand because none of them are random cards. This Correct. is to a... This is a very likely situation where you can double Omega Devastator, push seven to face, and never lose the game. Like, that is extremely likely. So double Omega Devastator, rush one in, healing for three, and then push seven? Uh, yeah, you would kill the one, two, and push seven. Mm -hmm. uh, but you don't want your opponent to heal at all, and you this desperately want to secure Oh, sure, yeah, yeah. Double, double Devastator, the Zilliax, yes. break one into the one, two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I love that use thing. I like it. Uh, this was uh, actually the double Devastator that's saving them specifically for the same turn was actually a play that was uh, my eyes were open to because of Bloody Face at the World Championship when he was playing against Roger in the full anti warrior lineup. He had recognized the situation where he just saved the Omega Devastators until he could get both of them at the same time, and it's too much tempo for your opponent to ever secure it back. And so it creates a race scenario where you're always winning the race. 
there is a 7-2 on the board that just hit Pavel in the face. I think that's what we need to t t talk about okay, right now, then. because there should not be. He's dead. There should not be for multiple no. reasons. Firstly, if that Shield Slam and uh, Mega De Devastated Zilliax were used in different orders, potentially, to be able to take care of that situation. And secondly, just the missed attack on the Zilliax. Yeah. I, I mean, Pavel, Pavel lost this game, I think, largely on his own accord. I think very, very stages. Yes. I think he played pretty wonderfully leading up to this point. I think Yarlow was too aggressive, and I think that you know, you kind of saw the price he paid for using the Attorney Rovers. It's a very small difference that makes, you know, a very large difference at the end. And but overall... Magnetic damage to the face is going to end that one 1-0 one in favor of Yala. And I think we have to file that one under the throw count for Pavel. Yeah. Um, I do want to highlight the things that they both did extremely well in that game. Of though, course. Because I think Bob Warrior games are inherently very complicated. I think the iterations are very subtle and they have stark differences and you need to be able to recognize them quickly. That game was very clearly in my mind going to an end game scenario where Yarla could not capitalize on having Dr. Boom Mad Genius in play. The Dr. Boom was actually a catch up card for him. And so once he had gotten to that scenario, I think he could have realized that by the state of his hand being entirely reactive, no way to capitalize on an Internium Rover sticking into play. And so I think he should have held the two Internium Rovers to pad the life total at the end. I think he could have had a more decisive win in that manner. I think for Pavel, the big thing I look at is the usage of the Zilliax because he got the second Zilliax. I think that he did a fantastic job of holding his tools for the right moments and understanding what the important spots in the matchup are. The major inflection point is always Blastmaster Boom. And he tried to play around that as hard as he could. Two Boom Reavers is a big kicker. But going into a two turn where your opponent has a 7-7, seven, seven, you have exactly seven armor, and you've been holding onto a Shield Slam for that situation, use it. Because there's a lot of bombs in your deck, and you're never going to get that opportunity again. So that, to me, was the beginning of it, was that Pavel had that one momentary lapse of judgment, and that cost him so much towards the end. Yeah, I think there was, you know, turns where he was sitting on 22, 25-ish armor, but at that point, like 60% of his deck was bombs or like 50% of his deck was bombs. So even the chances of that much armor being carved away, as you saw, you know, despite me crying that it never happens, sometimes it happens. And one of those times actually happened in this game. And we saw him scrambling in a turn where using the shield slam was so much more complicated than it needed to be if he'd have used it earlier, that it actually caused him to rope out and just completely blow the turn to a catastrophic degree. Indeed. And so we got to go to a quick break. Uh, players need a break and we need to break it as well. We can look at some side deck stuff, though. I'm curious to see what they'll be mixing it up with. So when we come back, we're jumping into game two of Yarla versus Pavel. Stay tuned. They've ever been
Tarso, Grandmasters for the European region. I'm that's admirable. He's subtle and subtle. We're getting into game number two of Yarla versus Pavel and both players moving over to their secondary decks. Yeah, both players potentially looking to tiny up a little bit from that first game, which admirable has many complaints about, um, but we've covered those in detail already. The most important thing now is the secondary decks that are coming into play or tertiary deck in the uh, case of Pavel. Oh, it's Pavel's secondary, right? Yes, it is. I'm being stupid. Um, Pavel is bringing in in uh, War Gears, he's bringing in Archivist Elysiana, he's bringing in his second copy of Omega Devastator, and a Faceless Manipulator as well, yep. admirable. This is uh, some tech that I have been turned on to that uh, honestly has been quite impressive when I've seen it. Uh, copying things that have Magnetic on them is very powerful. So we're looking at the War Gear that he's bringing in, and then Snip Snap as his primary two targets for that? Uh, sometimes it's opponent stuff as well. Okay, like, sure. Like, for instance, uh, Perhaps they land a big Beryllium Nullifier. Ah, ah, yes. That is a good point. Yeah. Faces Manipulator is quite a good card in the matchup. It's tough to use. I think it's tough to justify multiple slots to it. But having one in there, I think, is uh, is pretty fantastic. The the second Omega Devastator coming in. Uh, it probably should be in the main deck, but I see his uh, importance focused on the card draw where he has the two Acolytes instead. From Yala's side, we are looking at a slightly different way of going about it. Geppetto Joy Buzz coming in alongside for some very good targets for that, like Can Bloodhoof. Uh, Harrison Jones coming in as well. We saw how, pu how punishing the Harrison Jones was for Yala in that first matchup. And then he's, of course, including that Archivist Elysiana as one, well. One of my favorite things about this is this looks like whenever I build a deck of physical cards with all my, you know, weird collections and stuff, this is exactly what I do. I go, here are my cards on the left, and here are my cool cards that I really enjoy on the right side. <laughs> That's how I lay it out always when I'm looking at it. I'm like, ah, look at all these good cards. That, that just sounds like a bad way to build a deck. Well, it, it, just for visual aspects. Ah, you know, I like, see. Or, okay. You know, like if you could take a picture of it or something and right. you know, stare at the picture longingly as you're on your next ride to you know, wherever you're going that isn't to play cards. Double ones locked and loaded for Pavel. Yep, those, those are very important in the matchup. I think that's actually one of the reasons he may have included uh, Double Acolyte of Pain 2, is that in some of the other matchups, Acolyte's a bit better than Omega Devastator. Uh, and in the mirror matchup, Acolyte of Pain makes the ones uh, a bit of a liability to your opponent. Oh, I see you having the possibility of Acolyte of Pain in your deck makes their one attack minions less powerful early on. Uh, sometimes, yeah. Yeah. Slight spectator issue with the top hand. We apologize. We'll get that fixed as quickly as we can. Yep. In the meantime, a bit out of sync. enjoy this uh, so far very normally paced warrior game. <laughs> so we're getting that fixed as quickly as possible. Um, you know, if looking at uh, Yarla's hand, it looked like the just three drop. Go ahead. Uh, not really, I think, a huge advantage to either player. Yarla does have uh, Dr. Boom again Yes. Uh, in his opening hand here, but we saw him have to play catch-up with it in the first game. I don't think that's the case of this game because the way his side deck is built is so vastly different from Pavel's, where it's just a lot of stuff to keep going, where Pavel's got stuff to su uh, supplement an advantage that he expects to be able to grab in the matchup. Yeah, I was. it's actually the question I was going to pose to you is looking at those two side decks, like which way of going about the Warrior Mirror do you favor out of those two? Because that's my concern with the way Pavel's been going for it and a couple of other Warriors that we've seen go that way is that, you know, when you bring War Gears into your deck, if you haven't got like a Copper Tail Imposter, then you're you're looking to already be ahead to then capitalize on those War Gears because they can be very clunky cards to use otherwise. I, I think it adds an interesting dynamic to it because your opponent knows that you have the War Gear, so they're going to respect every single mech that you play. Mm -hmm. Like That, to me, is actually somewhat of a benefit. It's just the threat of the War Gear. I think at a lot of stages in the game, magneticing it, once you have a Dr. Boom in play, it's going to be good either way. It's just a 5-5 five, five with Rush for 5 mana. Sure. Um, you know, very much in the same way that Snip Snap is just a good card in the matchup. Obviously, Snip Snap's better than War Gear is. But it's kind of the point is that all of your mechs become threatening, and that puts a, your opponent in a different position than they would normally rather be in. And so for Yarla, you looked at game one, he wanted to be very aggressive. You're going to look at game two, where he's siding in just lots of valuable minions to play. He still wants to be aggressive here and have backup to it afterwards. How much does that change if he has to respect War Gear in situations? I don't know. 
It's a good question because there are a couple of clunky cards on Yala's side as well. You know, if he finds some early draws where he just gets, you know, a can and a Geppetto Joy Buzz in his hand, and meanwhile Parvel's curving out and dropping some magnetic mechs on top of that because Yala doesn't have the cards to even respect the mechs if he wanted to, and then that could be quite punishing. But I think it's it's definitely more interesting at least to see the two different uh, styles of secondary deck going against each other than both players just kind of switching to the same strategy and them stalemating again. I think it will probably create like a, 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 be a better dichotomy in terms of play style between the two players. Yeah, just I think the one thing that really concerns me a bit is that Pavel's brought in War Gears, and for Yarla's secondary deck, he's actually taken out the Spellbreaker. Yep. Yeah, I mentioned that in the intro that the Spellbreaker was going to bite the dust for the secondary deck, so Yarla clearly not expecting uh, the warriors that go up against him to be relying quite heavily so on that magnetic choices. strategy because, as you said, Pablo not only bringing in magnetic minions to play, but also faceless manipulator to create additional copies. Something else to note is that a Warpath and a Brawl have been removed for Yarla, and so Pablo doing exactly what he's doing now, just playing the 4-5, uh, I think is very solid. It becomes quite threatening to Yarla uh, that, that he's in this position. So now I'm curious... Uh, how this brawl gets actually parsed out because this is the lone copy of it. I'm looking at shield block shield slam I'm looking at dr. Boom Mad genius. This to me feels like a game for part for uh, Yarlow where he just wants to survive as efficiently as possible So what does that mean to you what is your conclusion from that statement that tells me I want to save brawl Okay, because I'm not gonna be able to shield slam a magnetic minion very efficiently and so I want to use Shield Slam here. I want to start finding uh, more ways to flex to the board state and save Brawl and just keep these little one ones around or the one drops around. Makes sense. A Brawl here to me would be a little confusing because obviously there's a 33.3% chance that the Omega Devastator lives, whereas you can have a 100% chance to just kind of kill that one minion that you want to take care of with a very efficient turn, Shield Block, Shield Slam. Yala goes the complete opposite way, going Zilliax instead. Yeah, I do think that the Zilliax uh, is a little bit less valuable for Yala this game. Um, Why is that? What's changed since the first game? A couple things I look at is Faceless Manipulator on Pavel's side. Uh, having your Zilliax Faceless Manipulator, not necessarily a good thing. And then the second one is that he expects to be able to take the aggressive stance uh, easier this time. I think also on top of that, now both players have Aliciana in their deck. They're a little bit less scared of, you know, six bombs in a row in the late game like we yeah. saw from these players, because if it gets down to that point, they can just Aliciana those bombs away. So huge amounts of burst damage isn't quite as likely. Uh, but the Faceless Manipulator point is a fantastic one. If Yala holds out here for an Omega Devastator Zilliac style turn later on, Pavel can just respond to that in kind with a Faceless Manipulator. Yeah. That's a great catch. Maybe... Th no, no. A bit sad that this gets attacked over by the Omega Devastator. I gotta move. But I think that's the game plan. Just close the trough from Maybe. now to seven, and then close the trough from Maybe. seven to ten. Pavel's gonna take that opportunity to get aggressive. I think this makes sense. This is the kind of thing I was expecting. We had a little spectator issue, and I was saying I think we'll see a bit more uh, polarization between the way the two players play. I think Pavel is going to be locked in to early aggression here because he sees all the additional value that he can get hit with if he lets the game go super long. His style of warrior deck for the mirror just kind of demands that he tempos out and just makes a platform for magnetism to come down on. like the plot of that first X-Men movie that you just described. Pavel is the master of magnetism. Is this what I am? <laughs> I really hope he draws war gear right now. <laughs> just specifically for that. <laughs> Dang it! Instead it was the worst card. Yep. I say the worst card. It's a very specific use of a card for a very specific instance that is very important sometimes. Yeah, it's a, it's a necessary bad card, or it's kind of an arms race card, right? Where, like, everyone has to play it because your opponent might. 
Like the old lab recruiter in Quest Rogue. Yeah, exactly. Like, if, if everyone would just agree that no one played Archivist Elysiana, then we'd be chilling. No one would play it. We'd be good. <laughs> but as soon as one person does, everyone else has to as well. Yeah. All right, okay. I see how it's going to be. Yeah, okay, fine. We're just committed to Elysiana world, have we? This is why fine. we can't have nice things. It exactly is. Oh! Pummel, on the other hand, can have nice things. Whoa! Mad Genius off the top with a pretty dead-looking hand for a, a couple of turns. That's the heat he needed. We got ourselves a game. It's such more... Honestly, I feel like this card just shouldn't be allowed to be in your opening hand simply for the sake that it's so much more exciting to see drawn than to see there. Like, when I see it there, it feels like an impending disaster that's coming up. When it just gets drawn, I'm like, let's go! You're like that when any warrior draws any card. That's it's not my, true. It's my impression. That's not true. <laughs> I wasn't like that with Yarla's opening hand. Amorable just loves all 30 cards in every version of Bomb Warrior ever. Hmm. If I built it, yeah. <laughs> yeah okay, that makes sense. Yikes. That is a weak-looking dynamatic. Oh, I, love that I thought it was pretty good. You know what? I'm going to say it. I want to kill the Eternium over here, even. Yala says no. I don't want my opponent to have armor. Ooh, I do want to have armor, though. Ah, I'm torn. Big whiff turn for Pavel, though. Oh, it is a bit interesting that if you attack the Eternium Rover, actually, that your opponent needs to use two Microbots to kill the Dynamatic. So in the grand sure. scheme of things, do you actually technically save more health? Not if you're going to get Missile Launcher. <laughs> That's definitely for sure. Also, something I'd want to bring up. Pavel completely dead turn last turn. Omega Assembly in hand a couple of turns away. Two copies of that in his deck, of course. Ever any consideration to look for something to play that turn? I don't think so. Um, you know, the main consideration, I think, in, in the Warrior matchups is... Is, is again like seven to ten are like seven to eight and nine are some of the weakest turns that warrior can have they have big cards at turn seven but they're not necessarily like strong plays that they have a lot of times you want to save them for the right okay, moment and then. so closing the gap from turn seven to turn ten is like always the priority for a warrior and i think that Pablo finding a minion there doesn't do that and i think it actually just increases the gap of uh of weak turns he will have if he does not have an omega assembly on turn ten like, that's where the payoff turn needs to happen, is turn 10. I'm unclear. You said he needed to close the gap between turn 7 and turn 10. That's always the goal. That's, like, macro perspective, the goal. So when he gets to turn 10, that gap is already gone then, right? If he has a payoff him. card. So oh, I see. Yes. I see what you're saying. Okay. So either Omega Devastator to do something or Omega Assembly to refuel. I understand. I was unclear on that. I see that now. This is one of the things I've liked most about casting with you is you will just call out dumb things I say, <laughs> and I have to clarify them, and it helps me just get better at what I'm supposed to do. Thank you, Saddle. You're welcome, Nathan. For my part, I like learning things about Bomb Warrior, because you're better at it than I am. I have fun when I'm learning. I feel like that's a quote from somewhere. It might have been, but it wasn't deliberately. It sounds like something Benedict Cumberbatch said in like one of his Sherlock episodes. Everything I say sounds like something Benedict <laughs> Cumberbatch <laughs> says. That doesn't narrow it down. You just peel off a mask. <laughs> I am Benedict Cumberbatch. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's weird. Why wouldn't you just say that from the start? Mm. Yeah, it probably would have been a lot easier road to get to this point if I was actually Benedict Cumberbatch. Yeah. I, I haven't been talking much about the Blastmaster boom from Yarla because he's actually yet to shuffle a bomb. Is that correct? Uh, he's had one Clockwork Goblin. One clock. There we go. Yep. Yeah, that's not enough payoff nope. right now. This is not a matchup where you need to play in desperation of hoping to either reach your opponent or of recovery. This is a look for the big payoff of Blastmaster Boom kind of game. That Brilliant Nullifier has been found. It was a big talking point in the matchup. 
Yeah, oh, I'm looking at uh, Pavel's hand. It's something he's thinking about is, A, how do I uh, respond to a Mega Devastator properly? And then B, how do I keep my opponent from having uh, bigger payoffs just with, you know, stuff like Karen, oh, Japan, Joy Buzz, etc.? Am I creating enough on board that I can threaten those cards? And so I think that's a very difficult question for him, and one of his top priorities is probably hanging on to Militia Commanders, given that there's both Omega Devastator and Karen in the matchup now to target with him. Light the muses! Take five, idiot. <laughs> Why are you so mean to Yarla? I don't know. Wait, do you mean Dr. Boom or it Yarla? Just, it just felt right. Yeah, yeah, Dr. Boom. Okay. Of course, of course. Oh, I mean, he's an idiot. I love Yarla. Yarla's my boy. I mean, I mean, you saw him try to steal Dalaran with, like, that rocket engine. Dude, it worked. What, what's a different, like, it, what? It, it worked. First gear and second gear, way too big a difference, <laughs> all right? <laughs> Your gear ratios are all messed up, all right? You yeah. need to look at that. Seriously. Like, imagine if you were just, like, you know, the first time you got on, like, a 10-gear mountain bike, and you're, like, pedaling, and you're, like, let me get this up to second gear, and you're, like, whoa! You just suddenly enter ludicrous speed. <laughs> Windows screensaver just appears around you. <laughs> Speaking oh, of militia okay commanders then. and saving them for four fives. Exhibit A. Have you ever double militia commanded a can before? Then you haven't lived. I'm... I'm honestly pretty interested in... Oh, it's because the microbots is up. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. You have to, like, I have actually made this play and seen this play made uh, in Grandmasters, I believe, but it's it's something that was called out. It's just like, it's a great play when your opponent does not have microbots or Kaboom available. Yeah, that to me is like one of the things that I actually really like about Dr. Boom Mad Genius is that the hero powers are like miniature puzzle pieces. Yes. Um, yeah, I agree. The thing that I don't like about it is that it's just so powerful. The thing I don't like about it is just everything else. It's just so powerful. Like, it, it is a bit much, I think. But I do like the the nature of the hero powers. They create puzzles. I like puzzles. Here's a puzzle for you. Can plus face equals good? Is yeah. that the answer? This is a, a five-path turn, if I've ever seen one. Perhaps it's a four-path and two microbots that actually is yeah. a bit, bit better. But I just do not think that Pavel's getting out of this better situation. I suppose there is some justification to actually using militia commanders and hoping your opponent develops hard off the back of that. Interpreting it as, I don't have a way to clear this. The gates. And Pavel very quickly the doing that. You know, I've heard Pavel talk about the game a lot. And one of the big sticking points that I uh, had with him is that he mentioned to me he likes to make plays that actively try to take advantage of an opponent making a mistake. And that really sat uh, pretty pretty deeply with me because I was thinking about all the lineups that he would bring at the time where he would always like target like the fifth or sixth best deck and I'm like why are you doing that he's like well if they make the mistake of bringing that deck I'm gonna I'm gonna crush them and I was like wow he is right that, that's like how he won a world championship people just bought a bunch of warrior to that this tournament I mean if you're gonna win a world championship you also have to beat a lot of good players that aren't making many mistakes but I do appreciate the perspective of like when you start off in a large open field yeah just beating people that you are better than will definitely get you to a certain point well i don't even necessarily mean mistakes in terms of like a readily identifiable sense mm -hmm. uh i just mean like it's a mistake given the context like the context here is hidden information pavel i think has concealed the idea that he has warpath fairly well um you know in the macro perspective opponents bringing warrior was a mistake but there was a level where warrior was a good bring uh, in the past instance, this anyway. Be a good time in that situation, I think Yarla can read into this as though there's no warpath and find a way to get aggressive. I feel like Pavel just played double Militia Commander because it was good. You think it's better than 5-path? It's a very similar board state, except you end up with two one ones, two two ones on the board on a turn where your opponent doesn't have that key answer to it, which, as we mentioned, doesn't happen every turn because of the way the hero powers rotate. Long story short, it's complicated. Yeah. Oh boy. There's two different cards you include in your deck now. 
and one that you don't, that you pick at a premium. I feel like I want the Devastator. Kind of feel like that too. I think there is a lot of merit to the Boom Reaver though, because he has the double shield slam. So he also still has two war gears in his deck, right? Yeah. Yeah, Boom Reaver's good. And that, like, not only does that pull me away from the war gear, because I don't want to be in a scenario where I have three war gears in my hand at any point in this game, that sounds terrible. Um, but then it also leans me a little bit towards that Boom Reaver just because of uh, how highly the stats are stacked in the remaining of his deck. Dynamatic pretty strong here. Uh, Whoa! What? Okay, I'm interested now. <laughs> I, I don't mind the extra card draw. I think that that's cool, but, you know, I'm pretty interested in blowing up that 4 4. Yeah. So a percentage of the time he still gets to do that while drawing cards. Huh. It's interesting because then it's the same thing where you're looking at microbots and you're looking at Kaboom being right, right, right. Some spots. Yeah. Oh, I kind of like it actually. Yala choosing to preserve uh, two health on his town crier just because Kaboom is active on the other side, as we were talking about. Both those minions had rush anyway, so there was no lost damage to face. Hmm. Ah, Pavel's turns keep getting very difficult. Yeah. There's just a lot of questions to answer. I, I wonder if he's actually like trying to, to maybe do too much, where he's like he's trying to find a way to like seize tempo, and I think he's just got to like stabilize the position a bit. Like every single turn for the last three turns, Yarla has been the one with the with the board advantage. I also wonder whether Yarla's trade there uh, didn't actually play around Kaboom as effectively as it could have done, because two shield slams remaining for Pavel with seven armor ah, actually that's... makes this um, Boom Reaver trade much better for Pavel with the Kaboom Hero Power. Like, what, what consequence does a 1-1 one, one dying have there compared to your 7-8 dying to a very common oh, removal that's card? That's a good point. I think it's something that's very small that has uh, you know, potentially big uh, implications behind it. Wow. Take five, idiot. <laughs> Last time. I promise that will not become a thing. Don't worry, guys. <laughs> Last one. Well, comedy is done in threes. That's true. So we're at the two check mark now. Yeah. If you're TJ and Admirable, it's done in 17s, where three through seven aren't funny, and then seven through 17 have become hilarious again because they push through. If you're going to put it in the technical aspect, presentation is an odd numbers. <laughs> okay, cool. This would be a good time for a master plan. I think that's why five mana five five feels so appealing. It's just all odd numbers. Like everything about it is odd numbered. Five mana cost, attack, five health, three numbers on the card. Is a 7-mana seven 7-7 seven 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 equally as appealing? Yes. Is that why everyone complained about 4-mana 7-7? Seven seven? Probably. If it was if it was a 3-mana 7-7, seven seven, that would have been fine because it was all odd numbers. That would have just been funny to people. Pop, probably, honestly. Hey, I'm just following your logic to its eventual conclusion. If it right? was like 3-mana 7-7 seven seven overload 4, <laughs> like... Yeah, I no, think that's got an even number on it. It has to overload an odd number as well. Just the visual, just the, the applicable visual numbers. I feel like you're no longer making sense. Uh, that, well, that's very true. Okay. That's been true for a number of years. A number of years. <laughs> I think Yarlis had a good recognition here that he needs to slow things down a bit as well. Uh, his hand is getting quite weak. Create the perception that your hand is reactive rather than your hand is weak. Sure. I think he's done a pretty good job stabilizing. Honestly, if you rewind just a few turns ago, Pavel was just 
beating away, threatening, you know, magnetic uh, war gear to come down and just end the game. Um, and Yala restabilized, honestly, to the point where he was a long way ahead with that Boom Reaver of his own. Oh, and maybe Pavel being able to answer that so efficiently is going to come back to bite Yala. Okay, then. Wait and see. That really was a big point in the game. Like, the fact that Shield Slam Kaboom ended up being such a massive impact. Yeah. I mean, Pavel's been sat on a Mega Devastator for quite some time at this point. But, you know, you are increasing the range of things that answer your 7A by doing it the way that Yala did. Yeah. Minor mistake with a big consequence. That is that is often the uh, the full case of Warrior. Minor mistake, big consequence. I wonder yeah. if that's why people enjoy it so much. People enjoy it? Well, like the people who really enjoy Warrior, it's like, it's because your decisions just hold a lot of weight. Yes. A lot of the decisions are quite easy. Your opponent played a thing, blow up the thing. Yes. Okay, I think, then. honestly, a part of it might just be the challenge of, like, you can consistently outplay, like, the average player in a Warrior Mirror. Um, but I think the challenge of it is that you have to make so many small incremental decisions correct that it overrides, you know, them just getting a blowout Elysiana that's way better than this yours or be getting their Dr. Boons when you don't, play. right? It takes dozens of small decisions being better than what they make to potentially override that and the very best players are capable of doing that against a mediocre player against a player who is only a tiny bit worse than them that's when it starts to become tricky yarlow was looking for something specific here and i actually don't know what he was he perhaps looking to have a 6-6 six, six in play well, the problem was it put cards in his hand up to 10. And Snip Snap has now just been used like that. that well, I mean, he was always going to be able to play something that he drew, right? Like be it a bomb card that he can just jam out and make his doctor, his Blastmaster boom better, which he's been looking to do for a while. You know, be it Cairn Bloodhoof just coming out and being playable. Oh, he's already seen Cairn. Never mind. I'll take that one back. I just, I, I don't know. I don't like using Snip Snap that way. That's a very valuable card in the matchup. Okay, then. I'm curious what he has in mind. Like, you know, one, as we're approaching this stage now and the game is still looking fairly even. Yeah. Um, you know, the, I think one of the things that Yarl is fearing here is that Pavel just suits up and hits him in the face. Yes. Uh, if that doesn't happen, we are rapidly approaching the turns where Archivist Elysiana yes. is, becomes a tough tempo turn if you cannot seize it properly. And so we're reaching a point where players are going to have to fight about as aggressively as imaginable to make sure that they can secure Elysiana and not get completely tempoed out. Yeah, took the words pretty much right out of my mouth where we are getting very close to, you know, the alpha Elysiana turns, um, where essentially your opponent has to play Elysiana, so you want to generate as much pressure on the board to punish them for playing that Elysiana. And it's again one of those situations where a good player will be able to outplay a mediocre one because a mediocre player will recognize that situation one to two turns before they're about to play their Elysiana, whereas the good player will have already been fighting for that position three, four, five turns hence. Uh-oh. It's certainly looking like Pavel is the alpha right now. Yeah, this board's not getting dealt with. Not efficiently, anyway. This would be a good time for a master plan. Best case scenario with Brawl is a 2-2 two -two lives plus a flood of additional 1-1s. One that doesn't seem good. Hmm. Oh, I love that ah, thing. that did not feel like a long turn. So now the best case scenario is a 1-1 one -one lives with a flood of additional 1-1s. One -one. Yeah. Specifically your 1-1. One -one. Specifically your 1-1 one -one is important, yeah, because you can always brawl first and then smash the microbots afterwards to clean up a little bit. Yikes. That is a lot of damage to be taken. And yeah. Pavel has just a big thing to play if he wants it. Oh, Dynamatic here is insane, actually. You're not wrong. I guess Warpath is it? Is, Yarla used both Warpaths? 
Oh, he used the one. He sided out one. He used, right. one. He used one and took one this out. This would be a good time for a master plan. Oh, wow. All right. Well, then Pavel's got options. And when you have options as the aggressor, as the aggressor in Bomb Warrior, that is scary for the opponent. Yep. This deck is one that usually thrives on just having a powerful answer. It's either there or not. It's about threat checking. When you oh, just get to take okay, the lead, then. figure out which one's best, you are... Whoa. Yarl is in Trub Trub. I mean, we've kind of talked about what cards Yarla has used that make the uh, Dynamatic better. He's also used two Shield Slams, two Omega Devastators, and his one copy of Brawl, which all make the Bulldozer pretty amazing as well. Like, that's really hard to kill in that spot if you yeah. just go through that route. That does require the I'd rather concede than fork of the discovery yeah. option. I would have been okay with it here. I think the Dynamatic's a bit stronger. Sometimes I look at Spark Drill and wonder how it costs six, while Dynamatic costs five. Okay, that thing costing then. six has made it stuck in hand for a number of turns. Really similar to a Security Rover in that regard. Just tough to use a six mana card. Yeah. Yala well and truly desperation stations now. He looks calm though. Wow. Final shield slam for two. I think it's the best he's gonna get from it. Yep, absolutely agree with you. Oh, it's just boy. Just a sad sight to see. Oh, boy. When you're this desperate. So, War Gear pushes six here. I was thinking uh, War Gear Faceless. This would be a good time for a master plan. Suits up a second 6-6 six, six on the board. Curious about Zeliac's faceless. Does cost like you the damage from the hero power, though, which is significant in this scenario. Yeah, I, I definitely want to spend ten mana. The reason this I was looking at the Zeliac is that it starts to create like that giggling inventor dynamic, where there's just so many attacks necessary at that point mm -hmm. that it becomes difficult to push past. Pablo just making six sixes. Can't say I disagree with it. The Spellbreaker's out of the deck. Ow. And even Faceless Manipulator has Rush when you are Dr. Boom Mad Genius. Spend to do time for a plan. Sorry, what is? Kill board, I'm at seven, go. <laughs> All right, yeah, sure. Oh. No, I don't want to do it. I mean, what else you got? Oh, spark drill. <laughs> this is all spark drill's fault. Yep. And as mentioned previously, almost every single efficient answer to this is out the window. It would have to be something randomly generated for Yala, I believe, at this point. Spark drill? <laughs> Microbot spark drill answers it. I did say something randomly generated. I guess that checks the box. This is like the third time. 
in two days where we've lamented a card and then just somewhere down the road it's like, ah, spark drill, perfect. <laughs> perfect is not the description I would give to it. What about in comparison to the rest of the hand? Mm. Adequate is about as far <laughs> as I would stretch. This would be a good time for a master plan. Oh, I love that fuse thing. Yala's just so far away here from making anything happen. Like, even if he's able to control the board for the next several turns, he then hits fatigue. And then he's in a position where he has to spend nine mana on Archivist Elysiana or he dies to fatigue. And if all he's doing every turn is answering the minions that Pavel is playing, he never gets to do that without taking people down. Yeah, I was wondering if he's paying that helps. specific heed to uh, holding onto enough cards where if he doesn't draw a bomb next turn, he can not draw bombs for a couple turns, perhaps. Okay, um, sure. I, I think at the end of the day, he's concluded that's just not a realistic possibility. Right. And then that draw for Pavel right there really changes how this turn might look. I mean, you may say you might concede instead of pressing that button. I'm looking at pressing <laughs> that button and like, I'm like, that is the play. last priority I have right now. <laughs> Given that Yarla is at seven with a blast shield up, I think you can... Oh, oh okay. nope, that nope, solves the equation. Anymore. That solves the equation very nicely indeed. Two bombs going in. Somebody order a bomb. Shield slams. Oh, he dodges. He finds a bomb, but not the one that Pavel was looking for. But he does it. the 3-2 in the wrench caliber means he can't play the Elysiana. Right. So he's going to tank the bombs. He's down to a 66% next turn. Hmm. He does have the blast shield, though. She pulls him up to 11. Uh, Pavel then takes him down to 8. Pavel's also got... Seven even with the kaboom. He's got Blastmaster Boom and Warpath. Oh, jeez. It's just... Yeah. He just beat him up this game. Yep. I'm, I seriously am looking at specifically that Geppetto Joy Buzz turn. Like, we used an Eternium over and a Snip Snap to kill a 2-2. Right. Hmm. Oh, snip Snap is like... Thing. It's like a brawl. Like, it could just blow up the whole board by itself. It is very much like a brawl. Four damage freely allocated however you want, essentially. For three mana. For three. Somebody Super swipe. <laughs> Steambot. I like this. That's the only way he can hope to live. Yep. It not only prevents the damage coming through from the wrench caliber, but it also has a chance of soaking up some boombot damage. <laughs> Oh, jeez. Hmm. I just want to devastate it. But then, are you ever playing Blastmaster Boom again? That makes me want to play the Clockwork Goblin and the Blastmaster Boom, but you get one less Boom Bot. Okay, then. I want a Warpath, but there's a zero nine. 9 <laughs> You could take out the zero nine 9 here first, right? Yeah. Wait a minute. What is he thinking about? You just rush the Boom Bot. Yeah, that's it, ridiculous. And warpath after, yeah. That has to be the play. Wow. I, didn't even, I forgot the Boom Bot said rush. Oh, this is ridiculous. Why did this take so long? Because it's a game-winning turn where there's lots of calculable probabilities involved, okay. you might as well go through them all. Yeah, true story. Yeah. Like, all of the percentages here are in range of being calculated. And the last one wraps it up for three. The BM delay on that last boom bot. It's like, just, just hold up a second. Three. Just taps it in. Yeah. Pavel ties up the score, which means that we're going to game number three. And... Uh, tempo was, I think, the overarching story of this one. 
that Geppetto Joy Buzz lost the tempo. And then Pavel had it majorly attained on the turn that he used War Gear to Magnetic and then Faceless Manipulator. So I don't know if you remember the turn in detail, but are you are you just criticizing the post Geppetto part of the turn, or would you not have played Geppetto that I turn? I don't at all? think I would have played Geppetto at that point okay. because I, I think A, there was better plays to make. Uh, in that situation, and then B, I think that what you give up by playing Geppetto, which is exactly tempo, is the harsh part of that turn. You spend so much mana on the Geppetto that you're going to be put in a liability of a situation somewhere with how you're going to use it. Either A, you're going to use one of your one-cost cards immediately and perhaps not see a payoff from it, or B, you have a 6-6 six -six in play that's not doing anything that turn. Like, all the minions have rush at this point. So I am a bit questioning on the Geppetto Joy Buzz. I like the power spike it can bring. Like, for instance, when you fetch Archivist Elysiana, you don't have to worry about the tempo thing anymore. When you fetch Blastmaster Boom out of it, you have an extremely powerful tempo tool from it. But I think overall, the Geppetto, that specific turn is just, I think you're just giving up too much in comparison to it because that's where that's where Yarlum is really struggling, I think, to get a foothold in the game was right after the Geppetto Joy Buzz. So are we finding an answer to the question that I asked you before game one about where you would rather be in terms of your secondary deck, like what kind of strategy you're going for? Because I feel like the way that Yarla the, uh, has gone, that Geppetto Joy Buzz is kind of key to the strategy that he's gone with his anti-warrior deck. I, I think there's a couple ways to look at it. And number one is the Cairn Bloodhoof versus the War Gear. I think War Gear is a more flexible card. Um, I think that it's a little bit worse on its own in comparison to Cairn. The thing that I'm looking at is the way that the secondary decks are done, where Yarla takes out Spellbreaker, Brawl, Dynamatic, Eternium, Rover, Warpath. Pavel's taking out Warpath, two Shield Blocks, two Brawls. I think when you're adding in War Gear, you can justify taking out Brawls. You have more aggressive potential. I think the Shield Blocks are like borderline worthless in the matchup. Like, it's just a card I never want to spend three mana on. Right. But I think from Yarla's perspective, he needs to keep shield blocks because he has this plan. Mm -hmm. And so for me, the plan that Pavel has is superior because he gets to remove shield block from the deck. And I think that's where I stand right now. My fear with the with dropping double brawl and a warpath is that sometimes you are going to fall behind, right? The, the curve of this deck is not consistent enough to assure that you're going to be ahead on board every game. No doubt. And if you fall behind on board, in a percentage of your games, a fairly significant percentage of your games, and you don't have catch-up mechanisms, and instead you draw a 5-mana five 5-5, five five, that's where I start to worry about this build of the deck in the Warrior Mirror. We didn't really see that from Pavel. There was one turn where it looked like a possibility, um, which is the turn where I was kind of nitpicking with the trade order with the Boom Reaver. But even then, even though uh, Yala gave him the Shield Slam opportunity, he still had an Omega Devastator ready to go locked and loaded. So it didn't really look like he was going to fall behind at that point. Um, but we are just taking a look at the uh, differences between the two decks. I believe Pavel has just gone for a well-deserved bathroom break after what was a very long couple of games so far. Yes. Um, but you can see in visual form the differences between the two decks. Yala gone with a, I, I would say, greedier version of the deck, whereas um, Parbles is a bit more focused on, you know, grabbing tempo and capitalizing on those opportunities. Yeah, it's it's just kind of strange to me that when I look down, what it really boils down to for me personally is the shield blocks. I really don't want to have them in my deck. It just, the Makes purpose, sense. I mean, the, it offsets five damage to a bomb at some point, but it also accelerates your pace to a bomb. So it helps you use shield slams, but at the same time, you're keeping shield blocks in where Pavel's, you know, he's pretty much taken out everything that he can't just actively use when he right. wants to. And I think that's an important mechanism of Bomb Warriors when you look down and when you add Geppetto Joy Buzz, Arthas Luciana, Karen Bloodhoof, and Harrison Jones. There's a lot of cards now that you actively don't get to just use whenever you want to. There's also the two brawls. There's also the two shield blocks. There's so many cards he just doesn't get to actively use. And um, Pavel's is the, almost the complete opposite of that. Yeah, and when sp specifically in a warrior mirror, and more so in previous metas than now, warrior mirrors often found these like horrible clashes where one player would deliberately not be playing cards so the other player could not play cards. And you create this scenario where they just have cards stuck in their hand and that makes their life awkward. As you're saying, when those cards include Brawls and Geppetto Joy Buzzes and Archivist Lucianas and so on, then in Bomb Warrior, you're faced with a lot of times the Omega Assembly dilemma, where you've got all of these cards stuck in your hand and you're looking for hand space to cast Omega Assembly, but can't do so because you have so many of these situational cards in your hand. Indeed. That's it. That is exactly what it boils down to. That, that situation you described, I think, is like the classic warrior situation. If you see somebody who's able to manipulate opposing hand size by purposefully not playing things so that the opponent has to make worse plays, 
that's the start of watching somebody who understands yes. what Warrior is truly about. And so I think that people should look for those opportunities. And I think if you're learning the deck, to exercise those very aggressively so that you can learn simply when not to do them because you don't get the opportunity very often. Yeah, the, the very best Control Warrior players are controlling the plays of both players, not just themselves. Indeed. And not just the opponents as well. So game three is set and ready to go. <laughs> that would be a weird way to play the game. You just control your opponent's plays and not yours. Well, that's that's kind of control warrior, right? <laughs> sure, yeah, I guess so, yeah. You're like, go ahead, do something, idiot. <laughs> yep. Blow it up. Like, I can't do anything. Town Crier, Town Crier, Blastmaster Boom. Okay. Are you serious? Well, how about Town Crier, Blastmaster? Oh, oh that's throwing a Turnium Rover in there as well for, for Pavel's side. <laughs> Pavel's already just off. He's away. What are these hands? Good. Ah, thank you. I was unclear. <laughs> <laughs> hey, yay! <laughs> what, go okay, guys, in, like guys, I know it's been a long series, but just, just take a moment. <laughs> to me, it's like the Eternium Rover is like Flanders with the bell. And like Homer's like the town crier where everyone comes out and starts rooting for him afterwards. Here ye! He's got the loud ding. I'm like, they're ringing the same bell. Why is Flanders is such a high pitched like nonsense? And what now? One drops are very important. Specifically on the first two turns. Like, I think this is one of the weirdest decks in the game right now where it's like the warrior deck has the best one drops. Yeah. Yeah, tell me about it. And it's just such a double whammy to have so many of your one drops in your opening hand because not only are you able to just get them down and get pressure early, of course, Town Criers set you that then set you up perfectly for the mid game, but it also means you just don't have dead draws in your deck anymore. They're just not sat there. You're not drawing a one drop on turn 15 this game. You're going to draw something impactful. Yeah. Dr. Boom picked up for Yarla. Start getting the bombs going. It is a bit of a detriment that uh, he felt it necessary to use the coin in Wrench Caliber. And I don't disagree. Um, I don't necessarily agree either. The big one is when it's compounded on the issue of exactly what Pavel's done here. Um, if the Wrench Caliber was not in play now, you're looking at those one drops instead, getting in an additional five to, to seven damage instead right. of you know an additional two to four. And I think that's a wise use of the coin. Like, I think it's, I think coin is actually pretty miserable in this matchup. I actually talked with this about Gallant, talked with this topic, talked with, talked about this topic with Purple and Gallon. And this is a funny story I'm going to tell. I don't know if he wants me to tell it or not, but I'm going to tell it anyway. In the finals of the Masters Tour in Las Vegas, because I had convinced them that sometimes, given your opening hand context in a Bomb Warrior matchup, you could justify what? coin no. armor. Um, he considered in the finals <laughs> what? coin armoring to pay heed to that notion. And he's like, I decided not to do it because I saw a world where I could win. <laughs> I was like, how many futures did you see? <laughs> he's like, ah, too many. But coin armoring up in the matchup is something that I have experimented with. Uh, I don't like doing it because in the cases I draw seven and seven, uh, I like having coin, but coin is just so bad in the matchup. Like, it is truly atrociously awful, and I find it stuck in my hand at the end of a lot of games if I don't use it. Like, ooh, early, that is. Oh! What? <laughs> no, it's just... I, you guys can't see this, but Admirable was just sat with this just look of expectation on his face at me at the I'm end of that I'm story. Look, I'm looking at your monitor. Oh, too. what? Yeah. You have your own monitor, oh, well, buddy. It helps me keep this the conversation flow. This is mine! Low. Stay away. I I'm can gonna, look where I want to. I'm going to put up a paper barrier. This is my side ah, of the very desk effective. over here. Yeah. yeah. It's not working. I can still see the whole thing. You were covering up part of Yarla's face with it? That is not the uh, intended use of Zilliax, and that is the play where I'm certain Yarla is very dissatisfied. Yes. I think it's made uh, with the exact heed to the fact that he drew Warpath, so even if this happens, he's able to get rid of this. And this wrench caliber is huge for just smoothing out Pavel's curve here for the next couple of turns, allows him to push damage, and then these bombs being shuffled in, sending him down this big turn seven power play.
I can picture a world where Omega Assembly here is correct, but I think I'm just double warpath and taking my two armor. It's fat. Business is about to pick up. Yeah, this game's about to get, it's about to get rough. And you kind of look down at that coin, and this is one of the important scenarios of it, is being able to respond to a Blastmaster Boom with exactly Dr. Boom coin, Shield Slam. Right. Because otherwise, you get locked in the exact reverse situation where you're unable to play Mad Genius in response because you just end up tanking too much damage on the backswing. Double Shield Slam just taunting Yala now. Well, he does have Shield Block Armor Up Shield Slam as a response if he wants. He does. And that gives him Dr. Boom Shield Slam. I actually think that Shield Slam might have been a good draw because of exactly the yeah, Shield the Slam the Shield Block. Wow, yeah, that's so sense. weird. It's like a card that's so like mediocre in the matchup, but in this one spot. Yeah, I was going to mention, you know, when you were going in on Shield Block a lot, you know, there are other cards in your deck apart from bombs. I don't think it's like entirely polarized around that. Um, we'll talk about Yala's Blastmaster Boom response in a second. Um, but I think it's interesting because I think we're pretty far established that it's not a fatigue matchup yet, right, right between the two bomb warriors. So shield block actually digging you through to important cards in your deck, I think does have some relevance, plus the activation uh, possibilities for shield slams. It just so happens that your deck happens to be full of a lot of bombs on a lot of occasions. Yeah. That's kind of where I'm at. Maybe. I like using Archivist Lysiana aggressively to replace bombs in my deck, not necessarily a fatigue situation. Yeah, yeah. It's just... It, that's, it's a weird, funky card. And I think Pavel here is absolutely interested in securing damage. I don't know if that's via Faceless Manipulator. Or Snip Snap. Or Zilliax. Yeah, I'm thinking Snip Snap. I, I mean, the, the notion that you could understand what the bomb scenario outcomes are Maybe. before and after you play Snip Snap, when you play it, how you play it, etc. Whoa. So he's interested in clearing off the opposing boom, is what it looks like to me. So he's playing the Militia Commander to try to soak it. one single attack from this, or uh, one single hit All right. from a boom bot. That worked out. No, you can still attack one more boom bot, right? Well, not necessarily, because it can change bomb right. to bomb to bomb to bomb, and then it dies. Sure. Well, it's, it's mostly just because you want the boom bots to connect face instead of to connect to... Uh, the Dr. Boom in that situation. Okay, that's fair too. <gasps> Take five, idiot. <laughs> I said that was the last one. <laughs> Cut it out. Yeah, for you. <laughs> All right, fair enough. Yarla finds the, the situation though. I think this in hindsight was the right call, but you are lamenting the lack of Zilliax that's in your deck now. Yeah. So think about the aggressive play from Pavel and what it prompted from Yarla's side. Super important this game. Knowing that the Warpath is gone too, you're free to spread these out or stack them up. Triple stack for Pavel. I think it makes sense. Faceless Manipulator in hand. In hand, sorry. If it lives, it's just such an insane payoff. I mean, even if one of the one ones lives. But. Against Kaboom specific, ah, is it against Kaboom specifically? Ah! I'm thinking about Kaboom specifically. Second Shield Slam Kaboom is the only thing that really checked this. Why are you so dramatic today? I'm a very, very calm person. I my Tranquilo. What, is, what does that mean? <laughs> I don't even know if it's a word. Tranquilo. <laughs> it, it's not an English word, I can at least no, tell you no, that. No, no, it definitely isn't. It, it may be horribly butchered Spanish. Tranquilo sounds like a very weird metric measurement. It is Spanish for calm. Just had it confirmed to me. Thank you. Nailed. We're, we're in a way we were doing the Spanish broadcast. Apologies. Mm. I really wish I knew fluent Spanish right here because I would just cast the rest of the turn in Spanish <laughs> and somehow shout goal at the end. Let's draw for some gas. Bobble is now desperate to find some big answers behind this. And he finds it again. Don't tell me Dr. Boom decided these matchups both players had in all three games. Yeah, both players had all four this game, importantly. 
And now the Geppetto Joy Buzz looking sweet, though. You're a bit worried about Dynamatic and how you, I'm sorry, about Omega Devastator specifically and how you don't necessarily check it. Okay. But I think with getting seven armor and with two Omega assemblies in hand, this you probably can do something pretty nice with this. Play. Yeah, it's the one thing that I am looking at, so Geppetto would end on six cards this turn with the hero power, and then one Omega assembly would take him down to five, up to eight. Second one takes him down to seven, up to 10. So yeah, he still has plenty of hand space freedom to be able to get rid of all three of these cards in quick succession. So Do you need to oh, think about the uh, Discover a Mech Hero Power as well? That's, that interact? that's a fair point. I was, so, so I was about to add to that. If you play Omega Assembly first, then you are more likely to then be able to throw other cards out of your hand immediately, which cuts your hand size down over the course of the next two to three turns. You also get information about how your next turn should be played. So like in this instance, yeah. uh, Boom Reaver obviously taking precedent over pretty much everything else. And so... Uh, for Yarle, he instead gets to develop Cairn, which is a better overall body. He doesn't get the value and the immediacy, but he anticipates being so far ahead in a lot of situations in this game that he now can forego Joy Pedo Joy Buzz and have it be his final threat as opposed to his initial threat. Right. And so that's the account for the hand space on the Omega Devastator is both Discovery playing Geppetto if it has the payoff and for using Boom Reaver. And so everything here pans out to Omega Assembly first. It's a lot of thinking to do. Crucially for Yala, though, he has almost entirely stabilized from a position where he was just a few points of damage away from being dead a yes. few turns ago. This would be a good time for a master plan. And now kind of the reset begins. The players will struggle once again to kind of um, achieve dominance before we reach that end game position where Archivist Elysiana comes into play. Because oh. with both Blastmasters and both Mad Geniuses gone, it's going to be hard for either player to build a board state that's not reactable to by the opponent's yeah. handful of removal, which is always there because every card in their deck is now removed. <laughs> this is kind of where, where Yarlis finds that payoff, though, right? Is if both players have fairly ideal openings, you suffer a lot of damage, but you get to a point where your cards just on an individual, you know, piece by piece impact are more powerful, I'd say, in general. Is also the point where he gets to leverage the fact that Parvel does not play the big removals, the brawls um, that can bring him back if Yala generates a huge board state. Honestly, there is just no upper limit on what the best board looks like for Yala. The bigger, the better at this point. Yeah, that that is a that is a definitely a cost of not having brawl this in your deck if you fail to maintain to tempo. You know, at pretty much any stage of the game, this is a situation you can commonly fall into. Omega Devastators can greatly impact this, but a lot of times with Pavel's game plan, he will be using Omega Devastators aggressively. Which he did. He played one for a 4-5 early on. And so now what I'm looking at is where can Pavel take advantage of like the Faceless Manipulator and the Zilliax? With a Boom Reaver in play, you have a massive opportunity to get a big thing done. But there's always a cost to it. has to be about the best faceless turn you're going to get in this game, though. It's just outside of the range of Omega Devastator in terms of a singular answer for it. Yeah. That's one of the things that I like about it the most. Also, it's just the biggest thing. Like, those are the clunky cards in hand. Why did I say its name? It always shows up if you say its name. I was also get, there's, there's Microbots and an Eternium Rover hanging around. I'm not sure how relevant that extra one is against a, a Mega Devastator, but, you know, it's a thing. It's a number. 11 is technically bigger than 10. I'll take every stat I can get. This would be a good time for a master play. The Arlo would have taken a 7-9 in the last game. Oh, yeah. Remember that kaboom? Yep. Hmm. Hmm, indeed, Dr. Boom. Yikes. Just the big things. Big idiots. Oh, I love that thing that Relax. So is there a Clockwork Goblin coming down alongside this? I imagine so. I'd be pretty hard pressed to not find Clockwork Goblin getting into play this turn. Like, what's the downside? 
No brawls on the other side. Nope. Those are taken out of the deck. Nope. It's a clean zap target. Maybe that's one thing you can look at. You're just offering up a 3-3 as opposed to a 4-2 with death rattle. Not a big deal, though. Just get it in play. Maximize pressure. Get your board as big and wide as possible because hmm. Pavel cannot deal with a big wide board. God, this turn is just not good. Do you know why? Because he has a spark drill in his hand. <laughs> that card ruins everything, Admirable. I was looking at using spark drill this turn. <laughs> <laughs> I want to do a turn him over the 1-1, one, one, spark drill the 4-5, run the two 1-1s one, into the front half of Cairn, and figure the rest out next turn. <laughs> no one has ever spent six mana on a spark drill and won the game, Admirable. <laughs> Screw this car. Look at that little idiot driving it as well. Sorry, I've just developed an actual pathological hatred of the card Spark Drill. <laughs> this is very real to me right now. Yeah, when that's Pavel's response to your turn there, you're looking at this hand from Yarlow and going, oh goody. What's the next big dumb idiot I can play? And he is not short on options. I'm thinking uh, it's probably a Turnium Rover Bulldozer here. Maybe you want to secure the magnetic damage. Very reasonable. The thing for me is you're staring down Blast Shield right now. Ah, you know they have the Spark in hand. Dang it. <laughs> he can, he's able to check the uh, the Divine Shield with, with a single mana. Ah, I see. So I guess the conclusion he's going to reach is probably somewhere on not foregoing seven armor and then using Beryllium Elfire instead. Yep. I think because you are staring at that Blast Shield, you know that uh, Shield Slam is one of the only high impact removals your opponent has left. So make something immune to Shield Slam. Makes sense to me. I think your opponent is starting to send you pretty clear signals that they do not have Omega Devastators in hand as well. Take five, idiot. Yeah. War Gear Militia Commander can answer this. Yikes. Yep, I don't like foregoing seven armor. I am unexcited about that play you have proposed. Well, let's figure something else out then. Let's All right. figure out how to hit the seven armor button. That seems to involve letting that 511 live. Does Spring Rocket help? Is that what that card even is? Spring Rocket, two damage, two one. Yeah. Uh, do a two one for three, battle cry, deal two damage. Yeah. The mech. Argent Mech Rider. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That'd be seven oh, mana, okay, nine, then. ten. No, it's only ten damage that you can yeah. use that way. So it's probably clean up the rest of the stuff and figure out the attorney remover later. Oh, I love that news thing. Which brings us back to War Gear territory. I like the Shield Slam there, honestly. Yep. I think we went over in detail why that was a good idea in the last game. Because heaven knows when he's going to have that seven armor again. Dynamatic's looking pretty good here. And I'm thinking suit up the Eternium Rover even bigger at this point. This would be a yeah, good dude. time for a I mean, He didn't deal with the first back. Yeah. Beryllium nullifiers are just so free in the matchup when your opponent doesn't play Brawl, right? Because the one fear of just going super all in on a Beryllium nullifier base once it lands is that they can just like play a minion Brawl and then 50-50 they win it. But that's just not an option for Pavel. Yeah. It's also Omega Devastator. You know, like that, that's right, the right, number one check to the scenario. And right, Pavel failed it, that. But if you start pulling it above 14, then you're, at, you're getting out of range of that as well. And look at that. 10-16. You're done. Take five twice, idiot. If Pavel spent everything, he has 13 damage on this <laughs> Eternium Rover. <laughs> Is that true? 2, 4, 9, 12, 13. 14 with the Hero Power, does that fit in mana as well? No, no. it definitely doesn't, yeah. So this is the play. Suit up. 
Gain seven. Bootleg Ziliax. Jeez. Slowly but surely. Just tossing damage into a 10-16. <laughs> like, oh, my goodness. Ah, just kill it. No armor. With a divine shield. Crucially. <laughs> Bang. Take 10, idiot. Oh, this is my kind of bomb warrior game. <laughs> Big stuff. I think you can definitely see the flaw in, in Pavel's plan for the mirror, right? I think Yala's done an excellent job of exploiting it over this this third game. You did see the flaw in last game from Yala's, though. I mean, there's pros and, better, there's pros and cons to both sides of it. And yeah. it, it, it's going to boil down to a matter of consistency at that point. You right. know, the notion that someone could have figured this out by repetition so far, I think, is ridiculous. Look how long it's taken to play three of these games. One of them wasn't with the first game in play. Yeah, call cool, up, buddy. Hey, you want to uh, test some Bomb Warrior mirrors with me? Yeah, sure. I'll just set aside my August. <laughs> Six games later. Oh, that was that was valuable information. <laughs> yeah. See you in February. Pavel is done. He has been fully out tempoed. He is not recovering. He is dead. D E T dead. That's a new way to say it. Sure. Valiantly fought, but at the end of the day, that Eternium Rover just got too big. And Yala, for the first time, looks comfortable. Suddenly, sat back, chilling. I think he knows he's got this one in the bag. That belongs in a museum. There's exactly one other time I've seen that happen. And it was Jason Joe at the World Championship. He saw a Warrior Mirror match, turns ahead, and he sat back in his chair comfortably. That Yala sit back. Doesn't matter what's going to happen from there. He knows it's 2-1. And Yala's suing up. He's getting ready for an interview. Headphones Whoa. on all of a sudden. Let's go. Um, but yeah, I, it was a very long series, very grueling series, but honestly, a pretty interesting one. And I think, you know, I called it out when we saw the two players going in two different directions with their two versions of the deck, that it was going to get a lot more interesting from that point because they had the opportunity to play in different ways, to leverage different advantages that they had. And I think you called it out perfectly where one player nailed that advantage in one game and then one player nailed that advantage in the other and it really boiled down to that first game of just who had it with the uh, the primary versus primary indeed and so Yarla's ready for the interview Yarla can you hear us yeah I can what's up guys what's up congratulations on your win here today I think a very impressive uh, bomb warrior series that we saw um, I'm gonna kick things off with the uh, GM overall grandmasters as a whole uh, talk to me about your thoughts on it so far what you've liked and uh, you know some of your standout moments uh, yeah, so basically this season wasn't very good for me. Uh, I messed up a few series, so I think I could have like, won like three more series if I played perfectly. So I might uh, make playoffs, but now I'm basically out. But overall it was a good experience. Uh, I learned about the specialist quite a lot and uh, hopefully I will be um, stronger in next season. Uh, so about the series you just played, um, you and Pavel went in very different directions with your techs, with him going magnetic and more tempo stuff, and you kind of more top end with uh, Geppetto and so on. Like, how did that change the way that you played the matchup when you got to the second and third game? Uh, so basically in the second and third game, uh, I need to get like ahead so he doesn't uh, get the value of the war gear because uh, most of the times you don't have... Uh, removal for that if they go like if they stick a mech and then magnetize war gear then most of the times you just ended up dying uh game two uh i at some point i got ahead but then i lost the tempo i might be i, I maybe was supposed to just gem my boom just as a seven seven harrison without value and stuff and they yeah, just jam my, my cards i feel like so that may might cost me the game and game three um uh, Pavel was ahead there, but then I somehow came back. Like the Dr. Boom on 8 with Shield Slam, it was like the key turn. And so I want to talk, uh, you mentioned that you learned a lot about Specialist. Um, the two of you just having the very different uh, secondary decks in general, uh, which one of these two plans do you think you favor, uh, you know, given the matchup that you just played and just overall, like was Pavel something you considered? And then what are the benefits of yours versus Pavel's in this instance? I feel like uh, the my sideboard is a little bit better. I don't like uh, cutting like brawl and uh, 
Yeah, I don't like cutting removal in general in Warrior matchup. Like uh, the last game, like I uh, ended up being uh, like a lot of ahead, and Pavel, if he had brawl, he had chance, but he wasn't playing any brawls. Uh, so I don't like that, and uh, not sure about the war gears. It might be good. All right, well, Yarla, I think that wraps us up uh, here. Unless Saddle has any more questions for you, I'm good. Just want to say, well played. You know, I'm sure it wasn't as successful a season for you as you'd hope, but I think you still played great overall. So, congratulations. Thank you. See ya, guys. Yeah, I, I think I, I echo his sentiment there. And I, I like his reflection where he's like, yeah, a couple more series, if I'd played him a little bit better, things could have gone my way. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's going to be a lot of, of Grandmasters that we're talking about, you know, come yeah, season yeah. two, is you play a little bit better, things could have been very different. The the problem is when you start falling into that trap and then you have to start applying it to everyone, right? So it's, oh, if I'd have played perfectly, I'd have won three more series. Well, if that guy had played perfectly, he'd have won three more series as well. So like the league table just starts to shift in a very, very different way. The, the bottom line is, no one plays perfectly. And your job as a top player is to minimize those mistakes as best you could. Indeed. So we can take a look at the standings and see uh, where Yarla sits after his win. Uh, out of the running for playoff standings, but uh, a six and seven overall record so far. You know, he's at Boulder Fist over. He's looking to improve it to War Golem uh, on that win-loss stat line. So, you know, I think if he can get to the seven, seven mark uh, overall, that's pretty darn good. This field is insanely stacked through and through. Yeah, you know, 50% win rate against some of the very best players in Europe and therefore, just by definition, some of the very best players in the world uh, means that you have done pretty well for yourself. And Yala is right to be hard on himself for his performance, as all these players will be, you know, going back, picking out mistakes, wishing they could have done things better. But in the heat of the moment, with 70 odd seconds to make a decision, no one plays perfectly. And I think Yala has personally played great.